Hello friends! Today I want to show you Acolyte of the Altar, which is a roguelike deck builder. Now, I know as soon as you hear those words you're going to assume Slay the Spire, and while clearly Acolyte of the Altar will be inspired by Slay the Spire as every roguelike deck builder is, it is a game that has made some inspired, some fantastic choices that truly elevate it from the crowd and make it worth experiencing. Today I want to show you what this game is, how it works and then offer a little bit of criticism. I do want to preface the criticism by saying that I think this game is excellent and I wouldn't levy the criticism that I'm about to levy at this game at a lesser game. All of the criticism that I have for this game only exists because the rest of the game is that good. Alright, let's get ourselves into Acolyte of the Altar. The first thing we do is we choose a patron. Well, in fact, we get to choose two patrons. We get to pick a greater patron and a lesser patron. Here you can see if we click this, it will highlight our greater patron and this will highlight our lesser patron. These patrons do have an impact on what we play. So if we pick a greater patron, let's say if we pick this guy as a greater patron, we will have access to different things in the game than if we were to pick this guy as a greater patron. Uh, by picking a greater and a lesser patron, we gain different cards and a different starting ability. And so that is kind of uh, something you can use to vary up the game a little bit. There are obviously just a whole bunch of combinations that you get from this alone. And you can also enhance the challenge by uh, selecting things like this to increase the difficulty, right? For example, with patience, rerolls cost two more beetles. So that's just kind of something that you can do but i'll leave that up to you for now let's go ahead and uh, go with uh, which patron let's maybe go with the red patron because i think it's the most straightforward one and uh, should showcase the basic principles of the game very nicely although i do want to say that each of the different patrons does play quite a bit differently where the red one is a lot more straightforward just kind of like you attack things with creatures the center one is uh, a little bit more tricky with a variety of sacrifice outlets and a variety of ways to utilize uh, spells while the one on the right is more spell heavy uh, that also applies a lot of debuffs just so you have a loose impression of this. I should also say that I've played about four hours of this game and I have beaten the game with all of the patrons, just so you have a bit of perspective there. All right, let's get ourselves into the Marrow Wastes. Here we are. Our first opponent are the Fates. This right here is the general look of the game. We are going to be fighting enemies. Now, this game really feels less like fighting a series of enemies like you might be used to from something like Slay the Spire. And it feels much more like a series of bosses, similar to something like Fury. Uh, which, by the way, play Fury, it's great. <laughs> but anyway, so it feels a lot more like a boss rush because each of the enemies that we fight, uh, they are going to be a fairly long battle and they all have fairly complex abilities that are clearly carefully crafted. Each enemy was specifically designed. There's no randomization with what abilities the enemies have. They are always the same. Although when the enemies show up, uh, does vary a little. So you will not always fight the fates first. We have mana in the bottom right corner. We have HP. This right here is our life if we lose all of this then we lose the run up here we have enemy hp if we get this to zero then um, we win this fight over on the left side we have our deck of cards we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment Right now, let me explain combat to you. So you have summoning sickness. However, uh, because of my patron, I get to start out with this little crabby boy here uh, who has charge, so immediately gets to attack. I can also spend my mana to play things. For example, this mana pool coins a 1-1, one, one, but if I have extra mana, it will consume it and then get bigger. So I just go ahead and summon a little fish. I can attack by moving things up here on the board. And yes, this was something that surprised me a bit, but this entire board is our play space. So I originally assumed that this would be our side of the board and this would be the opponent's side of the board, uh, but that's not how it works. This is our side of the board and this is also our side of the board. Our opponents exist entirely in this space up here. 
I can put a unit up here and then I can click attack and it will attack and we have done a damage. I can attack once per turn. What that means is I can select as many units as I can or as I have that can attack and then they will all attack at once. I can do that whenever I like uh, but after I've done it once I can't then play another unit and attack with that as well. All right let's end our turn. It is now the beast's turn and you can see that the beast's abilities activate. The fates have three very important abilities that we should immediately have a look at. So first we have spin, summon length of thread until your board is full. So the way the, uh, the beasts work or the way our opponents work is that they will do their abilities from left to right. So first the fates will spin, then they will measure, then they will cut and eventually they will also slash. Spin fills up our board with uh, little summons, length of frets. Measure will then kill all of them and for each one that's been killed it will gain counters and cut will then deal damage based on how many counters Measure has. What that means for us is that we can play things on the board to prevent this from happening, to kind of fill up our board and to reduce how many measure, like how many uh, frets the fates can measure on our, on our board. So you can see there's quite a lot of strategy involved already, but what I like is that all of the information is given. Uh, we know what's going to happen. So let me go ahead and play a little tiny disciple. This guy doesn't have any abilities. Then we select our attackers for the turn and we attack. Then we end our turn and now it is the beast's turn. The beast will summon the fret, it will measure, and it will then cut. When a beast attacks, they will always, well, not always, but at default, baseline, they will attack on the left side. So you can see here, cut attacks my fish. It will not attack the acolyte. The cut effect also has overkill, which means that it's trample. I don't know if I need to explain trample. I'm going to assume you all know what trample is. It has trample, right? So it will trample uh, to deal damage to us. So uh, we need to kind of plan for that. Now, unfortunately, we actually can't prevent this from happening. Uh, this will always happen. We will always take damage here. Uh, but what we can do is we can at least build up the board some more. So I'm going to build, uh, play this guy right here. This has a downside effect where at the end of turn I lose one attack, which isn't great. But I also get a little impling, which is just a little dude. And then we attack. By having four things on the board, spin will be less effective, which makes measure less effective, which makes cut less scary. But you can see here that this game actually has like very beautiful animations and that is something I want to point out right away. Because the design of this game has all of these individually handcrafted enemies that we fight because that was what this game was aiming for instead of trying to generate a lot of enemies through, you know, kind of like the usual generation, you know what I mean, right? And uh, then because of that, they were able to put a lot of care and attention into those specific enemies. That does also mean there aren't that many. You will encounter the same enemies um, repeatedly, not in the same run, but as you play the game a couple of times. I can show you later loosely how many there are. All right, let's play another Disciple. Let's play another Disciple because we currently have four mana and then we just attack. We do need to apply pressure because otherwise we're going to keep getting hit by cut and uh, that would not be ideal. So we have another fate here and then this yeah, tramples another damage to us. That's unfortunate. But we have five mana. We can play a tiny disciple. And then we've got a Lava Maw Smith. This is actually a great card. What this does is it makes it so that if it doesn't attack, then, then it has an effect that triggers. And that means all of our other units gain plus one attack. So we go ahead and we attack with all of them. You may notice there's this really nice feature where you can pick up multiple units at once. I love that. Attention to detail, right? Again, this is a game with a very small scope. And because of that small scope, they were able to put so much care into the few things that they've got going on. All right, let's go ahead and take down the fates. We have, killed, uh, we have killed the fates and now we get to claim a reward. Rewards are cards. Uh, we can re-roll loot, we can re-roll the cards by spending beetles. You can see down here how many we have. We also gain beetles when we just play the game. Uh, 
So, uh, Death March. Gain one mana per creature summoned this turn. At the end of your next turn, you die. That seems maybe a bit excessive. <laughs> Let's maybe wait on that one. But that one seems great. Cathedral Conservator. End of turn, summon a Crumbling Gargoyle. And Crumbling Gargoyle is this guy. Uh, it's a 5 1 that at the end of the turn loses attack. Let's get ourselves the Cathedral Conservator. So we add that into our deck. Now, this is where this game also is different. But let me let me actually do this first. Let me let me do this first. So um, we get to pick something. Increase your starting hand size by one. All forbidden fruits, start of turn, add a temporary swallow to your hand. It reads deal one. If this kills a creature, gain free borrowed life. Now, really important here. If this kills a creature, will only ever happen if we target our own creatures. The opponents don't summon creatures. The board is our space. So that's how you have to interpret that, right? I'm just going to go ahead and get myself some additional card draw. That's always nice, right? All right, let's go into the next fight. Here's the difference between this game and Slay the Spire. And I'm sorry for pulling these direct comparisons, but I think it's really easy to fall into that trap to pull those comparisons. And it's an easy way for me to kind of like make clear what I mean when I say this game distinguishes itself. So, in this game, your deck is actually limited. So if we have a look here, these are all of the cards that are left in my deck. That's it. It's not like Slay the Spire, where I discard my hand, I drew, draw new cards, and if I'm out of cards in my deck, then I shuffle my deck back into it. No. If I run out of cards, I am just out of cards. You can lose a fight simply by being worn down. So you need to keep that in mind. That's a really important aspect of this game. Alright, let's play an Impling. And then we immediately attack the Angler. And then we'll have a look at the Angler's abilities in a moment. It's the Beast's turn again. So, the Angler has Cast Master. Deal free damage to a random creature every time a spell is cast. Hits directly if they are none. So if we cast a spell and we don't summon a creature, which luckily... Uh, well, no, this right here is actually spell. So if you were to cast this... This would trigger, deal free damage to something we've got, and if we got nothing, then we will take the damage instead. Our character will take the damage instead. Lantern Learn summons the Angler's Lantern to blind neighboring creatures. So this will summon a little creature that enters our side of the board. Prot, deal one. So this will just deal one damage over here. It will just hit this guy for one damage, which isn't ideal. If we didn't have any creatures on the board, then it would just hit our hero. So the enemies will kind of work themselves through our creatures left to right. Okay, uh, time to start attacking, I guess. Let's go ahead and play a Crumbling Gargoyle, and then we just swing in. End our turn. And now it is the Beast's turn. We get a Lantern. And look at the animations, right? Lantern, unique animations for that. Angler's Lantern, death. Grant neighboring creatures minus one attack. Deals, uh, deal two direct damage to you. The way this works, it basically uh, has this lantern on the board and now it has unlocked swipe, which deals one damage to all our creatures. Right, so you can see here, we will take one damage and that will then kill us. Uh, that is not ideal. We would rather not have it die. <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't think we can prevent that from happening right now. So let's go ahead and play the Lava Maw Smith. And then we take all of these and we can attack with them. Lava Maw Smith, keep in mind, increases our attack damage. So even the Lantern can get a hit in, which is nice. Okay, it's the Beast's turn again. It will shoot, it will swipe. And we take a little bit of damage from the Lantern, unfortunately. And then it's our turn. We're in turn four. We have four mana. Although I, we don't want to play Swarm them, uh, because that's a spell. So probably best to just go with this Cathedral um, Conservator. That seems fine. That seems good. We could play a Mana Pool Coin as a one health creature, but I think that's a little weaker here, because as soon as swipe is ready again, and these things uh, are used every time it's charged up through these markers here, right? I think it makes sense. Now, I, I actually really like the enemy UI. It's very intuitive, I feel. But uh, as soon as that's full, uh, we uh, will get hit for one again, and then the one health creature would just die. That wouldn't be ideal. Alright, what happens if this guy 
I, I don't think it works if he, if he attacks. <laughs> I think, I think he needs to not attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we get another lantern. Thank you very much. Take a hit. No big deal. So, you can see this is now charging up over here. We do have some time. We do have some time and we will use that time. It might even not be the worst idea to risk a cast master now. If we, yeah, I mean, ah, I, I don't know. I don't want to. Let's go with a uh, fish. We summon ourselves a 5-5 five, five fish, take all of these and swing in. We only need to last one more turn the way things are looking. You can see uh, this guy, the Cathedral Conservator, is really nice if you manage to actually just keep control of the board state for a little while. Take down the angler. And we get ourselves another reward. Now here's something that I think is pretty important about this game. You don't get that many choices. You can see down there, hunting ground 2 of 12. That's it, right? We don't get more than that. <laughs> so we don't get to build a huge deck, like an entirely enormous deck. But uh, we do get to uh, upgrade our deck because here's another interesting element of this game. You can see over on the right side there, the tiny disciples that we started the game out with, they get replaced by our first few selections. So... We have a couple of Tiny Disciples, and then we pick better cards. Like, for example, Swarm them, which is actually a really nice card. Just wasn't good against that specific enemy. The Tiny Disciples get removed, so we don't have to remove them manually. Which I think is also just fantastic, right? There's always something that's kind of annoyed me about these kind of deck builders, where they always make you manually remove the crappy cards that you start out with. And it makes sense to me that you have crappy star cards that you start out with. That is reasonable enough because you know you want people to upgrade their decks you want to have them feel the progression of growing stronger but then you still have those crappy cards in your deck and you have to kind of take them out right or you kind of have to include them in your build i love the solution in this game where you start out with some crappy cards but they automatically replace themselves fantastic isn't that great all right so uh, we get to pick an event now this is something i will criticize the game for there are not a lot of events. I believe there are like four. I think I've seen four, maybe five. There are not a lot of them. I find that to be disappointing. I would have liked for there to be more than just these, right? It, it would have been nice to just have more of these. So we get to pick something here. Let's go with the tricky hunter. A strange looking man is crouching out of sight of some grazing animals. Go ahead and pick this. Tricky hunter. Still a stone, still a stone. The man mutters, holding a spear close to his chest. Before him grace a group of small, fussy creatures and their much larger mother. Soup of bones, soup of bones, he says. He raises his spear and begins to charge. Which do you help him hunt? So we can hunt little creatures or hunt the mother. Mother. If we hunt the mother, we get a card that can heal us. That's just this uh, filling feast. I will go for this because most of the time this is more healing. All right. The messenger's scribe. Oh, this is uh, actually really bad for us. <laughs> That's a tough enemy for us. Anyway, if we have a quick look at our deck, you can see that, again, there are way less tiny disciples than they were earlier. Another interesting thing about the deck, uh, which I will mention now, even though it will only become relevant in a little while, but another really interesting thing there is that actually there's a limit to how many cards you can have. So after we've replaced all of the tiny disciples, once we start adding more cards into it, the game will ask us to remove a card every time we add a card. So there is just a limit to how many cards we can have in our deck, and the deck is a limited resource that we can run out of, which really changes how you have to play. It makes it so you have to be really proactive, because if you stall for too long, well, you just run out of resources, right? On that note, I don't think we do anything here. I think uh, the this little... Uh, messenger scribe uh, doesn't uh, doesn't work out too well for us because of this ability right here. Future strike, counterattack, deal one. Unlike our counterattacks, future strike happens before the creature deals damage. So if I were to attack with my crab, it would just get killed. Which is <laughs> not ideal. All right, let's play a tiny disciple. Not to say we don't want to attack with the crab. We do want to attack with the crab, just not immediately, right? 
So you can see now the messenger scribe is unlocking some additional abilities. Piercing gaze, deal one direct damage to your opponent. This will just poke us every turn for one. And then star beam, deal 12. So that's our crab getting toasted in a moment. We're gonna go ahead and summon a cathedral conservator though. We'll keep the crab here to absorb the star beam hit and then attack with this guy who gets counterattacked for one. Uh, which is unfortunate, but I guess it happens, right? Piercing Gaze does one damage to us. Star Beam Blasts again. Great animations, right? Like, it feels so visceral. I really appreciate that. And uh, we're on turn four. Now, Counterattack only triggers once. It only triggers on the first unit that attacks. So we can actually just go in, and I think we will. Let's go ahead and summon ourselves these. Uh, these are little guys that come in with some extra attack, and they have charge, which means they can immediately attack. They don't have to wait. This guy gets Future Strike, Future Struck, I guess. And then we just do some damage here while we continue building up our board. Okay, so uh, probably not the worst idea to just use the Filling Feast right now, uh, because we are at 10, uh, 9, 9 damage taken, um, and this right here will restore 10 life. And we also get a little bit of a shield, which is the borrowed life. And then we have this situation, I think we just play a 5-5 five, five Fish. That seems all right. And then we just take all of these and we attack with them. And one more turn. And we should be done. <laughs> nice and quick. So I like to see. Piercing Gaze does one damage. One laser. Second laser. But at this point, we have enough on the board that we'll just be able to kind of take him down. Nice. And we get to pick ourselves a card. I really like this one. This one is very nice. So this has a unique ability called Dominate, which requires us to sacrifice something. So we need to have something on the board to sacrifice. Uh, but then we summon an additional unit, which is actually a very powerful unit. It has the keyword Fearless, which creatures gain more attack depending on the base max life of the enemy, which means this unit basically just does 10% max life uh, per attack, which is great. So we'll just go ahead and pick this up. It's also a great way to kind of take our early game units that don't do that much and turning them into something more powerful. So, Strike of Lightning, every time you deal over 5 damage at once, dealing 3 more. Or at the start of your 4th turn, gain 1 maximum mana. This is right here is something that I find a little bit irritating. And I wish the game gave you a third option here, and that is to skip. We can't skip. We have to pick one. Now you might say, well, why is that a problem? That seems fine. Well, the issue is down here, we've got the spiritual burden meter. And currently we had three. But as we increase our burden, right, currently we have no problem. But as we increase our burden, we will get downsides. So you spare this burden by profane gifts, draw one less card on fight start, and then back here. Your spirit is heavenly bur heavily burdened by profane gifts. Draw one less card on fight start and begin with one less mana. So this right here is a bit of a problem, I think, because sometimes you end up in situations where there isn't really anything you want to pick, and then the game still forces you to pick something which feels kind of bad. However, this is not one of those situations because I actually really like the Sunlit Spear, so we'll pick that up. That's actually a really nice one. Let's go into the Fading Forest. So this was sort of the first act done now. Although the uh, distinction here isn't as strict as you might be used to from other games. All right, so uh, we're fighting uh, a fungus this time around. Let's go ahead and punch the fungus and then end our turn. So, befuddling spores. Flip the health and attack of a creature. You cannot see enemy intense this fight. Deal two damage. Fungi flurry will deal will trigger two to three times. So in this fight, we will not know what happens to our creatures, although it's not that complicated. This right here will trigger repeatedly, which is actually really unfortunate because it does mean that uh, if I play this tiny disciple, it will just die. It's, it's just going to get killed by this, which is definitely a problem. Ah, but if we get lucky, maybe the crumbling gargoyle gets flipped. So this right here uh, flips um, the health and attack of a creature, right? 
So if we get lucky, that will target this, and then we have a four health creature there, which can hopefully take the hit. Ah, that didn't happen, so now we get hit by the Fungi Flurry, and that will deal damage twice, three times? Oh, that's unlucky. Okay. So, we need something that can take a hit, and we don't really have that. Wow. We are in a really bad spot. Okay, we can try this again. Keep in mind this summons a crumbling gargoyle. If we get lucky, this right here gets flipped. We just need to... Ah, man. We just need to somehow get something on the board that sticks for a moment. Which right now is turning out to be a bit difficult. Yeah. And Vida Binder Punch is now also active. If I took no damage last turn, deal free to you directly. Okay, so we could play an Impling. We had four mana right now. We need to just fill up the board with stuff that actually has some HP. So I think we played this Tiny Disciple, and then I uh, made a mistake. This guy costs three mana. Okay, well, that's not good. Yeah, well, I guess we just leave it at that. There's not really a reason to playing a second Tiny Disciple, so we'll just die. And I wanted to try uh, placing the Lava, Smith, uh, Lava Moor Smith again, just to kind of survive, but uh, that's turning out to be difficult. Alright, we need to start getting stuff down. So we can swarm them. We can impling. Take these two and attack that turns up off the vine, wind up punch. And then with fuddling spores, if we get lucky, it's hit, hits here, doesn't. But then if we get lucky, this only hits twice. Nice. Now we have a chance. That's all we needed. We just needed to get something on the board once. All right, so we attack here. It's fine. And then I think we just come in. We sack this dude. Put ourselves these guys down. And then also put down a Lava more Smith. And now we have a lot more HP on the board. Even more now, because this guy gets flipped. And with all of this life... We're able to stay on the board and survive. And now we can just start playing fish and disciples and just attack. At this point, this fight is pretty much handled. Yeah, the difficulty with the fungus is really just the beginning. You just need to establish something on the board, but that can be tricky. All right, nice. Actually, it's kind of funny, but turns out swapping this guy is maybe not the most effective strategy. All right, let's take all of these. Smack him. I think that's lethal. Very good. Yeah, we took a lot of damage in that fight, but it's how it plays out sometimes. Okay. From the ashes. Dominate one, summon two beast tormentors. That's actually a very good effect. Or we could go with the insect collector, play, summon a lone, la a lone ladybug, which... Great artwork, by the way, on these. I love the artwork on these. It's so nice. I'm going to go with the Insect Collector. Because uh, two mana is actually kind of a difficult point. Because we take out a lot of uh, the tiny disciples. <laughs> we still have the fish, um, which are a bit more flexible. But yeah, having two mana or having two mana creatures, especially s creatures we can sack, is uh, somewhat valuable. All right, now we're fighting the Unheeded Messenger, who comes with a message from above. All right, play this guy, smack. End our turn. And we get a friendly letter. Hover to read the letter. You cannot end your turn while you hold this card. Letter. Acolyte. We need not fight yet. Let us rest a while first. It is not safe here, but I will keep watch. Don't, don't listen to this nonsense. We smack him. <laughs> Alright, let's play this. Restores to life, which is nice. And uh, then we just play a guy, right? And we just keep smacking. Look, we're here to attack. That's it. It's not complicated. We're gonna keep attacking. Put these down. Now, sometimes you don't know what things do. I can check what this does. I can't check what these do. They're closed. I can't check what this one does. Uh, but Calamity doesn't sound good. Doesn't sound ideal, so we probably want to avoid it. 
Yeah, you can see those free extra damage. Ooh, they're so nice. They're so good. All right, we get another letter. So I already know this because I've played this game a bunch. But there's a trick to these letters uh, because you want to open them. You want to open them after you've played cards, right? Um, drink remedy. Listen to the messenger. Take five damage. Five. Oh, that hurts. Oh. Well, we don't want to let the Calamity get fully charged up, which was the other option. So unfortunately, I guess we're taking five damage. But there are also a couple that basically just make you lose mana. And those are fine. <laughs> I don't mind those. <laughs> because we just use our mana ahead of time because we're smart like that. Mm -hmm. All right, take some damage and our Star Beam. So there's a little bit of overlap in these basic attacks, but every enemy has unique attacks. Right? So not all of the attacks are unique, but they all have unique attacks. And I think that might already be enough. Very nice. We do need to find a way to heal, though. That's actually really important. So uh, we get ourselves another choice here. Uh, Lady of the Pack, discard your lowest cost creature. I gain their stats. Bound Fury, give me minus five, minus five. Or charge uh, summon... Give me plus one attack this round. I don't like any of these. And this is actually where it's important. We want to use our beetles. We do want to use them. This is the only use we have for them. <laughs> That's not entirely true. But this is the main use for them. Use the beetles. We can dominate. That's actually really good. Dominate one. Summon two beast tormentors. Beast tormentors are just these four freeze. The plaything doesn't trigger. Unless uh, we actually play them. So this summon... Doesn't doesn't count towards that. It's also battle cries, not Magic the Gathering ETBs. <laughs> All right, dice game or false profit? Let's do the dice game. You hear boisterous laughter and the rattle of dice in a cup. A group of nomadic acolytes are playing dice. As bets are made, a small pile of golden beetles builds up in the center. A gambler can take the pot, but to do so is to exit the game. Few do, as most value the game more than their wealth. We can take the pot, the pot to just get seven beetles, or we can go for broke and um, gamble them. And we will, I mean, like, let's go. Hey, we got ourselves a couple. This is another criticism I have for the game, by the way. So I said there were going to be a few, and here is one of them. Unfortunately, I don't think it does a very good job at communicating those kinds of events. We did just get money out of that, right? If you paid very close attention to our beetle count in the bottom left corner, then you would know we are now at 43. Now, I don't expect any of you were doing this, and the only reason why I was doing that is because I've played this game enough to know that I need to check. But uh, that's something really weird. It, the game should give you another screen and tell you, hey, you won, here's how much you got. Or hey, you lost, here's how much you lost. And instead, it just immediately throws you into the next fight without giving you any reprieve. This is a minor problem, right? But it, it just could make the pacing feel a bit more natural, which it currently struggles a bit with, right? It just immediately yeets you into the combat. Anyway, uh, we are fighting the Yearning Woods. So, stomach contents. Decreases by one every other turn. Start of turn, if stomach contents is 10 or more, it bursts and I die. If, st if stomach contents is zero, I starve and I die. Swallow. Deal one. If this kills a creature, I gain a free life and increase stomach contents by one. The, again, swallow. Hunger tanger tantrum. Sorry, not hunger tantrum. Hanger tantrum. If stomach contents is less than three, deal six overkill and knuckle break. Counter attack, deal two to all attackers. So, uh, there is a way to deal with this boss uh, that is a little bit silly, but we can just feed it. Of course, you can try to kill it. But uh, every time this thing kills one of our units, its stomach fills up. And as its stomach fills up, well, it'll get full. And eventually, it'll burst. <laughs> it's the safest way I found to fight this guy. Uh, but depends a little bit on your build, right? Again, this varies a lot based on your specific playthrough. But right here, I think we'll just feed the yearning woods. And I think this is also fantastic. I love that the game gives you these alternative win conditions sometimes. This is a cool game. I really like it. 
Although this is where we get into one of these high level criticisms that I warned I was going to bring up. I am not a big fan of the fact that this game doesn't really put much emphasis on its language. I hate hanger tantrum. That is terrible wording, terrible phrasing. Oh no, come on, you can do so much better. You could have named this anything. Hanger tantrum? Stomach contents? Swallow? I understand that these right here are supposed to be just like symbolizing that, okay, this is just like the physical state of this plant. Sure, I will accept that. But come on, you can give this a better name. You can make it more interesting than that. All right, we have beaten the yearning woods by feeding it. Maybe yearning a little bit too much. Okay. Um, let's re-roll. Let's re-roll again. Uh, let's re-roll again. <laughs> These are not great. Wildfire Drake is a fun top end, but I actually prefer playing lower to the ground. So we'll take from the ashes. And you can see, now we have to replace one of our cards here. And I will replace this mana pool Koi. I don't really like these very much. I actually prefer the implings because they apply a bit more early game pressure. And that does matter. Okay, so uh, choose your first draw each fight from four choices or your spells that cost two or less trigger twice. Now, here's another criticism. Uh, I can't check my deck right now. So do I have any spells that cost two or less? Not really. So I think that one just wouldn't do anything for us. So we will get the Whimsical Vessel, but this is something where I feel like, why don't you let me check your, my deck? Like, I feel like I should be allowed to check my deck in this moment in some way. I, maybe there is a way, but I don't know how. Okay then. So, we get to pick our first draw. Insect Collector on two is always really good. We do already have from the ashes, so we'll get Insect Collector. There's actually a really nice curve here. We can go... So first we attack with the Crab and then we play an Impling. But let's have a look at our opponent. We're playing against the Shambling City. 100 health, which is quite a lot. Five abilities, which is also quite a lot. Remaining residents. The Shambling City still has a few frail souls caring for its ruins. This is again where I think this is actually a great example of what I mean with um, language being... Uh, it could be improved. So prosel proselytize. We'll, we'll have a look at this ability in a moment, actually. Let's give this boss some time. I will discuss this point in a moment once all of the abilities are revealed. I think it will be a bit easier then. All right, let's end our turn. Uh, then we will summon our insect collector and we smack him. End our turn. The way this enemy works is that there's still enemies or like still souls within the city. And this right here, deal 1 damage times the number of remaining residents. If we deal damage, then the re residents go down and we can just kind of smack him to apply pressure. And then we don't take damage. Although there are other attacks over here that will do damage. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and play this guy. This guy is actually really good here. Because keep in mind, this guy does percentage-based damage, right? So he has 11 attack, which is very high. So we have now unlocked Proselytize. Kill the weakest unit. Gain residence equal to its attack. This I like. Proselytize is a nice, flavorful word. It communicates more than just like the matter of fact that is happening, but also it gives you intent behind it. And I think that's always really valuable. I think you want to communicate with your language more than just what is strictly speaking happening, unless it's very important for people to understand what is happening. Right? So sometimes being very direct is totally fine. I'm not saying that it is never correct to do that. But I do feel like that if you have the freedom to be a bit more flavorful in your language, uh, then you should. And this is where I think remaining residence is a bit of a... Well, it's not ideal. 
Because this is just like, okay, so we have remaining residents. Okay, I guess there's still people living in the city, but isn't there a way to phrase that that feels more interesting? Volley of rubble, this kind of works, right? Because like with the image, it communicates something that is interesting. Like, okay, the residents are throwing rocks at me. I like that. Can I tell you about my uh, favorite card name in a card game? There's a Magic the Gathering card called Nissa, who shakes the world. And I love that name. Because, like many legendary beings in these kinds of games, uh, many Magic the Gathering cards just kind of have names that are more or less job descriptions, right? Where it's just Chase Mind Mage. <laughs> okay, I don't know if there's a Chase Mind Mage. I made that one up, but you get the idea, right? When it's just this like really simple thing of just telling you, strictly speaking, what is this unit and what is their job more or less. Well, Nissa, who shakes the world, is a card name that communicates about this character through this much more metaphorical language. And that I think does a really good job at communicating that she's powerful, that she is powerful enough to impact a lot of things, but also it communicates this feeling of anger, I feel. This feeling of, oh, here's a character that really means business. <laughs> you know? Anyway, we've unlocked another ability. Titanic Strike, deal five overkill. So oh, we're going to take some damage because our ladybug friend is... Uh, in a bad spot, but I cannot move the ladybug. Doesn't work. He's just over there. It's gonna take some damage. The only thing we can do is keep smacking him. So I guess that's what we're going to do. We only need one more turn and then it's dead, which is unfortunate because we're gonna take free damage now. Oh, maybe not. No, we still take free damage. Yeah. No, actually four. Oh, that's annoying <laughs> because of the volley of rubble. White Void has now been unlocked. Destroy all creatures. Well, that's that's good for you, buddy. But I, I see a little trouble with that plan. We really need to heal. Four health. We might not make it through just because we're not finding the healing we need. But we found an excellent card. The Leviathan. Dominate four. So we need four things on the board to sacrifice to play this. It's an 8-5 for four mana. Charge immediately attacks. Play. Grant me twice as much attack as creatures you've summoned this game. And rally means it can immediately attack even if you've already used your attack. So it gives you an additional combat phase. Excellent. 100% putting this into our deck. That's that's a big finisher. Very happy that we found it. King of Beggars. Okay, this one is interesting. They are all interesting. It's the great thing, right? They all need. Uh, so I think we don't have a one drop in hand. We have a two drop. We have a three drop. So I think I actually go with the Impling here. So. King of Beggars. Beggars Bowl. A bowl of coins given by compassionate strangers. Hard up. Counterattack. Deal five to the first back row target, then lose one coin from Beggar's Bowl. Can hit directly. This ability also triggers like normal during the beast's turn. Let me just show you how this one works. Let's play our Impling. We will attack. Now we have used a coin, and it bonks our guy. And then once it's the beast's turn, it will also use another coin and bonk our guy. Once it is out of coins though, this will trigger. No effect unless Beggar's Bowl is empty. Deal 13, the Acolyte also damages King of Beggars by the same amount. So we want to get to this point and then have a board that can soak the hits. All right, let's play our Insect Collector. See, this is why I love having this card. This card is actually the MVP, I'm telling you. All right, we get bonked. That's fine. We don't want to attack too aggressively here, because keep in mind, if we do that, 
um, then we will just get counterattacked. So for now, let's continue building up a board. We can play uh, Swarm them to get two more units down. I think if I go like this, I get a Taxin and this guy dies. If I understand the mechanics correctly. Because this only triggers once, right? Yeah. Very good. So we are working our way towards burning it out of coins. Although Passing Stranger is now going to activate, which adds another coin into the bowl. I love the animations. Do you see what I mean when I say that this game has had so much attention to detail put into each individual fight? It's great. It's great. This would this is only possible for a game that really like wants each individual fight to feel impactful. All right, crumbling acaline and Felgard's battle trainer. Of course, when you do something like this, you have to make concessions. <clears throat> This game doesn't have that many enemies. Just doesn't. <coughs> play this. I think we will play a fish now. Attack. Another coin. And then there will be another coin which bonks this. And then we have managed to run the King of Beggars out of coins. Oh, shit, that triggers immediately. <laughs> well, that's not good. That's not what I had in mind. All right, uh, we will definitely attack. Definitely play this too. I play two? Probably. Just play these two right now. And then we end our turn. We do need to make sure we always have something on the board. Because we can't take 13 damage. <laughs> we can't even take 5. <laughs> Gotta be very careful with that. So if I attack, I lose one. That's fine though. I will always lose one, right? There's no way around that. And this way I deal a little bit of damage. And then I can just sack this guy. Give myself two more. Summon this one, which summons even more stuff. And I think with all of these on the board, we are safe. In we go. Okay then. Time to roll again. <laughs> we only want good stuff. We only want things that are worth having. Oh, from the ashes might have been worth it. Baphomet is interesting, but Dominate 3 is just very expensive. Hmm. I think I will probably go with From the Ashes. I like From the Ashes. Although we are running a little low on turn 2 plays. Yeah, that's definitely a little bit of an issue. This is again why the Insect Collector is so nice. I'll get rid of the last fish though. Oh, we found a chef. The smell of rich spices rises from a roaring campfire. So, for seven beetles we can purchase some food. A large man hunches over a thick metal pot. He has two tables on either side piled with ingredients, some familiar and comforting, others that curdle the stomach from both appearance and scent. Uh, we will get this one because it is more healing and right now we gotta we gotta get ourselves back up to a reasonable amount of health all right then quick hand check we've got a one drop two drop okay so we want to go we have uh we don't have a free drop right now yeah we have a big guy here and this guy is 60 hp i think i'm gonna go with the field guards battle trainer that one makes the most sense to me now, I do have to admit, actually, I haven't fought against this guy all that often, so this one might be a bit of a learning experience for both of us. So, Rage of the Earth. When falling below 40 life and again at 20, destroy an ability to advance the other Rage Gorgeous Gages by 2. I think that's how you say that. 
Alright, we attack once. Play ourselves the Impling. End our turn. Pincer Punches. Deal one to the leftmost and rightmost enemy can hit the same target. Well, that kind of sucks because this crumbling gargoyle is not going to live very long, but that's all right. Just as long as something survives. Because <laughs> we do need something to sack. So far, nothing too scary. We attack once. And then I think we will get this guy in there. Because this puts a lot of power on the board and it doesn't die to the pincer punches. Okay, let's put even more power on the board. Swarm them. Ooh. Pincer punches are now done. Sweeping strike. Deal two to all. Well, that might not be ideal, but uh, at least our big guy survives. But we'll probably have to sack him out because I do need to start finding better stuff. At least this one has a bit of a cooldown. Oh, five mana is really awkward. Can't play this. Yeah, we don't have a good five mana play, do we? All right, let's just attack. From the Ashes or the Cathedral Conservative? This one summons stuff. I think we want to have this guy on the board for as long as possible. And this seems to be <laughs> as long as it's going to be. Although sweeping strikes are going to be gone now, right? Hmm. Yeah, they will they will get deleted when we attack here. I mean we definitely attack. There's never a point to holding back, I think. Yeah. Alright, we have now unlocked obliterate. What does obliterate do? Deal six. Overkill. Ooh. It's not good. Uh, I think I will try to reduce that damage. Yeah. So as much as I can reduce it. Oh, wait. I think I had lethal. Oh, I'm stupid, right? I should just play the lava more smiths. Oh, no. Now I'm taking unnecessary damage. Yeah. Well, that's on me for sure. I should have just played the lava more smiths. Yeah, made a mistake there. Definitely a misplay. I didn't even find my healing. And this is coming every turn, so I guess I need to kill him. We do need to play the healing, which is the awkward thing. Oh, if we lose because of this, I'll be annoyed. <laughs> okay, we only have 11 beetles. Insect collector. Every time, for sure. Best card in the deck. Now let's get rid of an impling, probably. We only need an Impling once. Insect Collectors are much more important. Alright, and now we are at the Altar. This is the final boss. And yes, that's it already. There are not that many fights to take. It's a quick game. There's our healing. Hmm. Insect Collector... I think I should take the healing. I think I should take the healing. I'm not sure if this boss has direct damage, but there are a couple of enemies that do have direct damage. And if we run into something like that right now with our free HP, we will regret not taking healing. So I will take the healing. Which, by the way, another small thing. But if you heal, a red number pops up, which is the same red number that pops up when you take damage. I always thought I was taking damage at first. That was very confusing. <laughs> All right, so let's have a look at what we've got going on here. We've got uh, Lorenz Crunch. Your opponent cannot control more than four creatures at once, so we cannot do anything here. Hyper Star Beam, deal five overkill. Oh, thank God we have our healing. And an eye for an eye. When your opponent plays a card that costs five or more mana, negate the activation of the card, then destroy this ability. So I don't think there's anything in our deck that costs five or more mana, so we don't need to worry about this at all, which is nice. That's convenient. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and go with our Insect Collector. And we can get a hit in, so we might as well, right? 
Yeah, we're about to get blasted here. Ugh. Okay, this is actually really nice to have, but we want to save this for as long as possible. Melt Mind. Discard the lowest mana cost card from your opponent's hand. That will be this guy? That's okay, I don't need him. Uh, then, Elucidate. Frontline. Cannot be destroyed by a Dominate. Summon a Chosen of Nest. So it will summon a 1-1. One, one. Frontline means it's on the left side. Hyper Star Beam will deal damage to it. I take 4. Well, nothing I can do to prevent that. Infinite Potential. Increase maximum life by 7. So this guy will continuously grow stronger and stronger the longer we have this going on. But that's okay. Because we do have a Felguard's Battle Trainer. Which gives us uh, the Felguard here. And that should allow us to hopefully apply a lot of pressure. Alright, there's the Acolyte, and the Acolyte is going to get absolutely ruined. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, but we're at, we at 8. That's not good. Alright, let's go with the Lava Maw Smith. How do I ever get 4 units on the board for the Leviathan? Well, I can't. Right? The only way, because I get one, one is killed every turn, so I just need to play the Leviathan at the same time as I play something else. Uh, well, there's really nothing we can do about that, it seems, so we just attack. Luckily, our damage output is still looking alright, and I think we can still survive two turns from this, but that's it. <laughs> that's actually the extent of it. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, so we can go in with the Leviathan. Yeah, we should definitely do that. Leviathan does a huge amount of damage. Alright, we attack with these. And then... Leviathan sacks our board. And we get to attack again. And we don't have to worry about the Leviathan dying. No, we do have to worry about him dying. But it's okay, right? No, no, no. This right here takes a card out. I thought this was triggering, but that's okay. That's actually fine. Because Swarm them is just enough. Nice. Took him down. Bit of an aggro build, but... Who doesn't like... Who doesn't like a bit of an aggro build? And here's our ending. I do have to say, this is something where I feel like, huh, maybe, maybe a bit more effort could have been put into making the ending feel more exciting than just a few, you know, little images. <laughs> I care a lot about good endings. I care a lot about good endings. I don't know if any of you finished playing Sweet Dreams Alex, but... We put a lot of effort into that game having a good ending. But that's it. Uh, we beat a run. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I uh, then ended up taking an hour. Well, this video was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. But I had a good time. I hope you guys had a good time as well. And uh, yeah, so this is Acolyte of the Altar, right? You can play a variety of different runs. They're increasing difficulties. I would expect there to be updates as well. But it is a game of very limited content. So this right here is the full extent of the cards. Like, that's it. This, these are all of the cards. And this right here, this is the full extent of the enemies. That's it. That's all of them. There's, what's that, 18. There's just 18 enemies in this game. But, as you saw, each of them had a lot of care and attention put into them. And that makes them feel really, really special. And I like that a lot. I like that this is a game that decided to go a bit of a different route from what we are used to. And I think it really works. So yeah, anyway, Acolyte of the Altar really surprised me. Because these days when I hear roguelike deck builder, I just think it's gonna be Slay the Spire. It's gonna be Slay the Spire and it's gonna be a little worse than Slay the Spire. And it's just gonna make me want to play Slay the Spire. But that's not the experience I got from this game at all. In fact, I think it took a bunch of ideas that were propagated through Slay the Spire and really improved upon them. 
For example, Slay the Spire has you start out the game with a deck full of garbage, right? You just have your strikes and your blocks and they are very basic and they, do, they don't do very much. And then as you go through the game, you eventually have to either get rid of them or just kind of accept that they are part of your deck in combination with the other stuff that you actually want to use. Well, that doesn't happen in Acolyte of the Altar. Yes, you still start with garbage as you probably should because that way the players get to make the decisions of improving their deck, but they aren't forced to keep the garbage. In fact, half of the garbage replaces itself and then as you go further through the game, you will be asked to then take out another chunk of garbage and put in your own decisions, put in your own design. And I think that's so good. I love that idea. That is absolutely fantastic and really improves on something that I think has stagnated in other games. So overall, I have been nothing but impressed with Acolyte of the Altar. Uh, it is, however, a game that doesn't have that much content. So I've played it, well, I guess <laughs> for about five hours by now with that last hour that we just played together. And uh, I don't know if I'll play it anymore. Not because it's bad, just because there isn't that much content. I don't know if there are updates planned. If there are updates planned, then I'll be happy to check it out again in the future. Um, but for now, I actually feel like I've, I got... Well, I, I mean, I got it for free, so <laughs> I did get it from the developers, right? They were just like, here, go try it out. Should I say that at the start of the video? Maybe I should say that at the start of the video. Anyway, um, but I feel like I got a good experience out of the game, for sure. The only damper with the game is really that its content is a bit limited. But for me, that's fine. I do not mind a game with limited content if that content is good. And here it really, really is. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, I hope you guys give the game a try, and I hope to see you guys soon.